Hello friends, this is Jan Curcio, and I hugely appreciate your subscription to my channel and returning for another study, this one on the first epistle of John. Although many take this letter to be an exhortation on God's love and the believer's righteous response to it, others have recognized the overriding purpose of this epistle was to condemn the false teaching that had led followers of Jesus Christ astray. And the emphasis of God's love is John's way of drawing them back to the true faith. Although John does not name any particular heresy, it has well been agreed upon over the centuries that he is alluding to Gnosticism, the bane of the first church. Following John, others attempted to preserve the integrity of Orthodox Christianity by exposing this heretical movement, such as second century Irenaeus, who refuted Gnosticism and his work against heresies, which was responsible for leading many Gnostics in Rome back to Orthodox Christianity. Tertullian and Origen also exposed the false teaching of Gnosticism, as had others throughout the ages, yet Gnostic teaching never ceased to bring confusion, conflict, and dissension in the church, evident in some of the false movements that have impacted the church today. Although John does not mention Gnosticism by name, he does denounce the cult of the Nicolaitans in Revelation 2, 6 and 15. The cult, which according to 4th century Bishop Epiphanius of Crete, were a Gnostic sect that flourished in Ephesus and Pergamon, who like other Gnostics were identified by their false doctrines and libertine lifestyles. John would have been well acquainted with the Nicolaitans since his home base was in Ephesus, where the Nicolaitans flaunted their licentious lifestyles. Jude wrote of such heretics saying, and I quote him, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were mocked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude 1 verse 4. And it was the liberal lifestyle of the Gnostics that lured many to walk away from the true Christ and all that he had taught. And you might not know that Gnosticism is a philosophical movement that combines Oriental mysticism and Greek philosophy. That began around the time of Alexander the Great's conquest of the Orient, 300 years before Jesus of Nazareth. For Gnostics, there was a supreme God and a lesser God who was blind and evil, who they believe created the universe in which all matter is evil. From it developed a Christian form of Gnosticism in the early church, which like the Greek Gnostics held to the belief that spirit was entirely good and all matter evil, even the human body. And based on the idea that the body is evil, Gnostics presumed that sexual immorality was of no consequence to their salvation. Hence, one can do whatever they please with their bodies. Gnostics in the church were antinomian, insisting that they were not required to obey the Torah since it was only for the Jews. Yet, neither had they adhered to Jesus' teachings. And Gnostics, infiltrating the church, embraced a false Christ, apart from the biblical witness of the Son of God, who was 100% human and 100% God. They believe that Jesus is solely deity, not ever to have been flesh, since all matter is evil. Gnostics believe that Jesus only appeared to be human. The false teaching borrowed from the movement referred to as docetism, that claimed that Jesus did not suffer in the garden, nor on the cross, since God cannot suffer, and that Jesus made Simon of Cyrene to appear like him as he carried the cross and was crucified in Christ's place. Gnostics taught that Jesus hovered above the cross while laughing at Satan's attempt to kill him. Other Gnostic sects advocated that Jesus became divine at his baptism and that his divinity left him just before he died. The heresy referred to as Serinthianism. 
From the many Gnostic writings, we know that they did not consider the need to repent of sin, but to strive for enlightenment. The Gnostic means of salvation was not through Christ's suffering on the cross, but by attaining knowledge of the supreme God. Gnosis in the Greek, from where the term Gnostic and Gnosticism is derived, a knowledge that is secretive and available only to the elite for their enlightenment. Gnostics wrote contradictory works to modify Orthodox Church doctrine. And to give you an example of a probable Gnostic from the New Testament is the Samaritan sorcerer Simon Magus, Acts 8, 9-24. It is this character, if you will remember, who offered the apostles money to buy Holy Spirit empowerment in order to operate in the signs and wonders of the apostles that would draw attention to himself. Peter responded to him, and I quote, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither pot nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Verses 20 and 21. Church fathers, who referred to Simon as the father of all heresies, wrote of him saying that he began an antinomian cult referred to as the Simonians that was based in Samaria, lasting up into the 4th century. Second century church scholar Justin Motter from Samaria wrote of him referring to the magician as Simon of Gaeta, whom most Samaritans followed, believing him to be the power of God from the magic he performed. Notable Gnostic teacher, contemporary with John, was Marcion, who established two academies, one in Italy and another in the East, where he used church practices, including establishing bishops and priests, and using orthodox phraseology to seduce Christians from the true church of Jesus Christ. He omitted the Old Testament from his liturgy, since he felt that the God of Abraham was evil, and he altered much in the New Testament text that he didn't agree with. For instance, he rejected the virgin birth of Jesus, teaching that he had not been born at all, but simply had appeared in the Capernaum synagogue. Masian's cult lasted into the Middle Ages in Syria. And some of you are familiar with what has been preserved in ancient apocryphal writings, such as the Acts of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, Apocryphon of John, Secret Gospel of Mark, the Apocalypse of Peter, Gospel of Peter, and Acts of Peter and the Twelve Apostles. And although they make for interesting reading, they are replete with Gnostic heresy. So let me conclude here that Gnosticism was a major problem in the early church, and it was alluded to in 1 John. And let me say here that Gnosticism was not just an issue with John, but with Paul as well, evident from what he wrote. And I quote him, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, Colossians 2.8. And to the church at Corinth, Paul wrote, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God, 1 Corinthians 1.18. And to the Galatians, Paul alludes to Gnosticism, saying, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Galatians 3.1 And Peter admonishes them, But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand, and will utterly perish in their own corruption, and will receive the wages of unrighteousness, as those who counted pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices, and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. 
but he was rebuked for his iniquity. Here Peter alludes to the Nicolaitans, and like John accuses them of having followed in the ways of Balaam, the seer who led the Hebrews into sexual immorality in order that Jehovah would curse his own people. Numbers 22 through 24 and 31 16. And Peter continues to say, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Peter is referring here to those who believed in Christ, but who returned to pagan religion. Now, about the Apostle John, he and his brother James were called the sons of thunder, referring to their fiery temperament and or preaching style. And this apostle, whose Hebrew name is Yohanan ben Zebedee, John the son of Zebedee, is thought to have been advanced in age when he wrote First John, around 95 years of age, prior to being sent to the Isle of Patmos, due to the authoritative tone of the letter as well as having addressed the recipients as little children. And although it is not stated in 1 John that the apostle is the author, the letter's literary style and phraseology is that of the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation. In addition, John's use of polarity, such as light and darkness, truth and lies, and love and hate, as well as his style of repetition of thought, had been taken by 2nd and 3rd century church scholars, such as Irenaeus, Clement, or Tullian Origen, to be indicators of Johannine authorship. Further, the author states that he was an eyewitness of Jesus from the beginning of his ministry, verses 1 through 4, who could only have been one of the apostles. Moreover, John's assertion that true believers in Christ will love him and keep his commandments in his gospel, 1415, and the book of Revelation, 1217, is stressed in John, uh, the first epistle of John as well. And in identifying the recipients of the letter, we can know that since they are not named, it was most likely sent to more than one congregation. And given that his ministry was based in Ephesus in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, we can assume that the letter was sent to that region, particularly to the seven congregations he wrote to, as mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. And given John's location in Asia Minor, the recipients would have been primarily Gentile believers. And about the purpose of John 1, it is apparent that he determined to expose the false teaching and filtrating the church, the most prevalent being Gnosticism at that time. So bearing all of this in mind, let us begin to read 1 John and allow me to point out where the apostle alludes to Gnostic teaching and its impact on the church. And from the New King James Version, beginning in chapter one of John, in verse 1, it reads, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, that is Jesus Christ. The life was manifested, that is, he became flesh, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Here John qualifies himself as an eyewitness from the beginning, a bearer of the truth, that the word of life, Jesus Christ, came in the flesh. In confirming that Christ was incarnated, he is correcting the Gnostic teaching that Christ did not come in the flesh, but was solely deity. 
And John continues to say, beginning in verse 5, This is the message which we have heard from him, and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now for John, walking in darkness is following after false teachers, liars who were attempting to corrupt church doctrine with lawlessness, such as sexual immorality, not being sin that requires confession and repentance. And for John, the light is the truth, and the light is Christ, and that true believers were to walk in the light, that is to imitate Jesus Christ. And in chapter 2, John urges believers not to sin, but if they do, there is a way to deal with it through Christ. And he wrote in verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, the Greek term for propitiation is helasmos, which means atoning sacrifice. And then John defines a true believer, writing, Now, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Here again, John is urging believers to imitate Christ. And in verse 7, he wrote, Brethren, I write no commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you. Which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining? He who says he is the, in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now, the Greek term for hate here is mason, which variably means to hate, detest, love less, or esteem less. So apart from detesting another believer, we may consider them less than ourselves, which is more likely the case than the former. And John exhorting them not to mison each other indicates that there were disputes among them and grudges that developed in one form of hatred or another. And John continues to encourage them, beginning in verse 12, saying, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written to you, Fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. John assures them that they are true followers of Christ, and as such, urging them to not love the world and the things in in it. And continuing in verse 16, John wrote, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 
and the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. And the lust of the flesh is sexual immorality, as you know. The lust of the eyes is wanting everything you see, greed and gluttony. And the pride of life is having affection for the things of this world over God and his people. And then John warns them of the coming deception in verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. Here he is referring to those who had been among them in the congregations that had left the true faith to follow after false teachers, antichristo in Greek, or antichrist, distinguished from the one Paul referred to as the lawless one, the son of destruction, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 10. Those who promote a false Christ who did not come in the flesh and who did not save the lost through the cross. And continuing in verse 20, he wrote, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, that is the Holy Spirit, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Now those who deny the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are Antichrist. You cannot have one person of the Godhead without the other, for they are three in one, as John said in uh, 1 John 5, 7. In verse 24, John continues, Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Now John is telling them to hold to the teachings they received from the apostles from the very beginning, not the new wave of deceptive teachings coming at them. Here again alluding to Gnosticism. And so you can see up to this point that the purpose of John, first John is to warn true believers of the false teaching that has caused many to walk away from the true Christ, if ever they were. And John continues to write in chapter 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Now on one hand, John confirms their divine sonship, but on the other hand, he tells them that it is conditional. And he wrote, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. 
And the St. John is referring to here is a lifestyle of intentional and unrepentant sin. And then he wrote, whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren. If the world hates you, we know that we have passed from death to life, because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Again, John urges believers to imitate Christ. And about demonstrating Christ's love to one another, John wrote, but whoever has this world's goods and see his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. He gave us commandment. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. And in chapter four, John writes, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. John again points to the Gnostic tenet that Jesus did not come in the flesh, but remained fully God. And he goes on to say, And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this the love of God has manifested toward us, and that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is not speaking about the affectionate type of love, but the love in action that benefits another, a sacrificial love, as Jesus demonstrated on the cross for our benefit. And John goes on to say in verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. 
No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. That means he remains in us. And his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him. And he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been perfect, made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. And in chapter 5, John confirms believers standing in Christ, writing, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him, who was begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. Now, once again, John contradicts the Gnostic belief that Jesus was not made flesh and blood, and it is the Spirit who bears witness, he says, because the Spirit is truth, for there are three that bear witness in heaven the Father, the Word, that is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Here John also contradicts those who oppose the oneness and sameness of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And John went on to write, And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given to his Son. And John closes his last book, saying, beginning in verse 11. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Now, for John, the sin that does lead to death, spiritual death and damnation, is the sin not confessed and repented of, other than the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. And that's a study in itself. 
But listen to this promise. Verse 18, John wrote, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, and his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And so the message John left us is that we are to embrace the truth of God and reject that which is false. And we can know the difference between false and true through testing the spirit. And by being immersed in God's word, when the false comes at you, you will recognize it and know how to combat it. And we can test the spirit of someone by the fruit they produce, good or bad, which recalls Jesus's teaching. For a good tree brings not forth corrupt fruit, neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. Luke 6, 43 through 45. Thank you for staying with this lengthy study, and please hit that bell for notifications of further studies. And may the God of love and truth be ever so real and present in your lives, that you will remain in the light and the truth in spite of the ever-increasing spiritual darkness around us. And as Jesus promised, obeying his commandments will become easy.